Doubt sees the obstacles, but faith sees the way. Doubt dreads to take a step, but faith soars on high. Doubt questions who believes, while faith answers I. Pin your faith on no man's sleeve, but have faith in God. Faith hears the inaudible voice, sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. Our topic tonight is faithfulness and commitment. What do we mean by being faithful? And what do we mean by being committed? When we talk about faithfulness, what do we mean? Faithfulness is being obliged to your obligations regardless of the prevailing conditions. You remain yourself in any situation you find yourself without being dragged away from your position. Many of us are faithful only when things remain the same. When, but when there is some changes, we also change like chameleons. What do we mean by commitment? Commitment means that we remain the same regardless, regardless of the circumstance we face. We remain committed. Are you committed? It is the power of commitment that makes you to remain faithful. Are you faithful? Are you committed? When we talk about committed, it means that God can count on you, that you will not disappoint him regardless of any situation that may arise. When we talk about guidance, we mean that we can count on God because he will always guide us through the storms. Apostle Paul explained and testified before the Jewish council in the book of Acts chapter 26, verse, 30, verse 12 through 23. We're not going to read that. Concerning how he received a heavenly vision. And he remained focused to that vision. Do you have any vision in your life? He remained focused. He did not allow any situation to drag him out of the focus. The Lord Jesus Christ himself has given us the most urgent and important job on earth. And what is that job all about? Job of preaching the gospel and living by the gospel. He has commissioned us to preach the gospel to every creature. Are you making every effort to preach the gospel to every creature? This big job requires utmost faithfulness and commitment. Are you committed to preaching this gospel? This gospel can be preached if we remain committed and faithful. Every week you receive word for the week. Do you send this word for the week to some people who doesn't receive them? Some people in your office, you know their email addresses. They're your friends. You go out to eat with them. You chat with them. You exchange all worldly things. But do you send them this word for the week? No. Because you know you don't live up to expectation. You are scared. If it's in the local slang, we say, you feel malu to send it out. But you receive it, you read it, because it doesn't have impact in you. Therefore, you won't send it out. You forget to know that's a way of preaching the gospel. Even if that person is the worst unbeliever, you know, you can send it. That can touch that person. We can talk, 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 talk. 
talk less to men and do more unto men. Talk less to men and talk more to God. Paul the Apostle received a heavenly vision to which he was faithful and committed all through his lifetime. Are you still focused on the vision God gave you? Or you are always changing? You always change. The same heavenly vision is for us who are alive today. Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, I will not back off from the heavenly vision which you have given to me? You may ask, what is a heavenly vision? A heavenly vision could be described as a scriptural, spiritual awareness of divine imperatives. Divine imperatives. You are aware of it. Divine imperatives. We can also refer to it as a vivid perception of our unavoidable commission as soldiers of cross. You can't deny that. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you become enlisted in the army of God. You not, don't have anything to do with the world. Your past life has nothing to do with you anymore. You begin to fight against all works of darkness. Because victory is at hand. The heavenly vision is for everyone who believes. We must visualize it. We must internalize it. And we must actualize it. If you want to stand for Jesus. This we must do with a high sense of duty as it deserves it. Do you take serious the commission that Jesus had given to you and I when he said, Go ye into the nations and preach to all creatures? We don't. We work and work and work to make money. Some of us go to church only when we are at our convenience. That's all. Let me put it this way. Some people go to church when they are hatched. Other people go to church when they are hitched. Others go to church when they are dispatched. You know what it means? When they are born, they bring them to church to be dedicated. When they are getting married, they come to church. And next one will be during the funeral service. When they are dispatched. That's how they go. God watches. We must regularly hear about this heavenly vision, read about it, and run about with it. Bible told us, let him who read the vision run with it. Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do more from tonight concerning the vision of the cross, concerning the commission that Jesus has given to me? Are you willing to say that? In your office, you have some unbelievers. Have you ever made preparation to reach out to them? We talk about reaching the unreached, touching the untouched, teaching the untaught, and loving the unloved. Are you willing? Are you willing to say, yes, I am going to be an instrument that God will use to touch somebody? Every day, what is your prayer? God, help me to find favor from the eyes of my boss. December is at the corner. Let me have six months bonus. Lord, let me have the seat to go to Timbuktu for my holidays this December. That's all. Do you ask God to help you to speak to somebody today? Share the gospel with that person. We are going to divide this topic into three divisions. First, the need for a heavenly vision. Why do we need a heavenly vision? Secondly, the necessity of faithfulness and commitments. Thirdly, the nature of true Christian commitment. What are the things that make up a true Christian commitment when we talk about commitment? So let's go to the first one, first division. The need for a heavenly vision. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, I mean, verse 7 through 8. Philippians 3, verse 7 through 8. It says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. 
Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Verse 14. I pressed toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see what Apostle Paul was writing here to the church of Philippi? He made it clear to them and said, the thing that he had valued before, now he counted them nothing. They are rubbish. That he might gain Christ. Thing that used to attract him no more. Why? Because of the heavenly vision. Thing that used to make him to feel great is nothing to him now because of what? Heavenly vision. Because he wants to be instrumental to fulfilling the very call of God upon his life. What about you? It's nothing. His PhD, no use. That he might gain Christ. His persecution against the Christian faith, no use. Maintaining law as a Benjamite, no use. Just him might make Christ. Keeping the law of Moses, being a Jew, worshipping through the religion of Judaism, no use. That he might know Christ. What about you? Are you living up to the expectations of the heavenly vision which God has given to you? The consequences of lacking a heavenly vision is eternally grievous. You must know it. If you begin to lose sight concerning the vision God has given to you. Many of us, we are always on fire for God. But the moment we see somebody we are scared of, we close our mouth concerning Christ. That person, do you know hindrance concerning the heavenly vision of your life can be caused by your spouse? It can be your wife, it can be your husband, it can be your children, it can be your boss, it can be your colleagues. Have you ever sit back and look? Who is actually a hindrance to the call of God upon my life? Let's look at the benefits of divine vision. When we receive divine vision, a clear vision from above will inspire us, motivate us, stimulate us, and stir us up for fruitful service. When you have a very clear vision from heaven, that will be a source of motivation, inspiration, stirring within your spirit. When you receive from God, you will always be ready to give it out to people for them to also be blessed. Because you can give what you don't have. You cannot. It's insecurity that makes you to feel that you are nobody. You are somebody. People might not regard you, but God knows you. Secondly, divine vision will always guide and direct us to the path that God has prepared for us. It will keep us on the path of righteousness and service to our king. Because, of vision. because vision is actually a mission. And that mission takes you from the point where you are to the next point or next destination. That's why the Bible said, where there is no vision, the people perish. Vision is the eyes that lead you towards your goal. Next, another benefit of divine vision. A heavenly vision will enable a believer to have goals of eternal consequence. You always have goal of eternal consequence. People will be blessed. You know that yes, there is goal for. That God has said before you which you will enjoy the fruits in heaven. You always be joyous, happy. Because you know that your labor of faith will not go in vain. Fourthly, divine vision brightens the believer's way and life in the face of most adverse situations and conditions. Divine vision will always make you to overcome all hurdles of life, hindrances, impediments, obstructions, adversity, because you know where you're going. You wouldn't consider what you go through, but you consider the reward that you have later. And this will make a believer to have a meaningful life and pursue only 
a worthy cause. Because you know that's what you're pursuing. A worthy cause. You know that one day you'll be rewarded. As Apostle Paul said, I've run the race. I've finished the course. Now he's waiting for what? The crown. Not only for him, but for those who will do the same as he had done. Finally, a heavenly vision enables us to see the invisible. Heavenly vision makes you to see the invisible. It makes you to believe the incredible. It makes you also to attempt the impossible and thus achieving the unimaginable. That's what it does. That's what it does. It makes you to believe incredible things for God. And it makes you to know that surely you'll be blessed well above your imaginations. Now is the time to get envisioned and this vision must be kept bright day by day. The vision that God has given to you, you must keep it day by day bright. Must be bright day by day. We must be reading through it, meditating on the word of God, nurturing that very vision. We must also renew our loyalty to God on a daily basis concerning the vision. Do you renew your loyalty to God? Many of us, we like to go to churches where they tell you how to make money, but not how to make heaven. Because the world is like that. Everybody wants to live in $20 million bungalow. So you must learn how to, how to make money, but not how to make heaven. What shall it profit you to end the whole world and lose your soul? Secondly, Let's look at the necessity of faithfulness and full commitment. Turn the Bible a moment in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The necessity for faithfulness. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. You see what it says? It's required that you be found faithful. If you are faithful in small things, bigger things will be given. Are you faithful in small things? The level of your position, are you faithful there? If you're not faithful belonging to a department, how can you be promoted to become the head of the department? A good follower will always be a good leader. You cannot be a good leader unless you're a good follower. How can an insubordinate person become a leader? Look at what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 13 verse 17. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 17. A wicked messenger falls into trouble. But a faithful ambassador brings health. You see? A wicked messenger falls into trouble. Are you a wicked messenger? Are you a person who always likes to create problems wherever you are? Instead of being an Israelite, you become Ishmaelite. Every hand is against you. And your hand is against everyone. A good messenger, a good ambassador, will always bring forth healthy results. But he said, a wicked messenger will always fall into trouble. As Christ's followers, we are also his ambassadors. We serve as his stewards. That's, what, that's who we are. We are Christ's stewards. Therefore, we must learn how to reach out to people. Do you know why you are blessed? You and I are blessed to be good stewards. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. We are blessed to be good distributors. We are blessed to be good servants and not lords over people. That's why you are blessed. That's why we are stewards of Christ. We are laborers in a lost vineyard. Therefore, we must remain faithful and committed. We are his ministers and co-workers. All these roles put upon us a grave responsibility. We must therefore... Be faithful and committed. When you know the position you hold, 
that will make you realize that you carry a great responsibility. Many people are looking up to you. Will you disappoint them by your nonchalant attitude? If you are married, many people are looking up to you as a role model. But how can you be a role model when you are beating up your wife, kicking her like a basketball or punching pad? How can you be a role model when you open your mouth? The walls of righteousness will collapse because of vulgarity from your mouth. Evil words. How can I be? We are stewards of the mysteries of the gospel. We are to declare to the whole world, the whole counsel of God, whatever the cause might be, we must serve our king without hesitation. We must serve King Jesus diligently and dutifully. When you are serving in any department, serving in any ministry, serve with sense of diligence and also duty. Take it a yes. I'm serving the king. Don't think that, well, if I serve nicely, the director will be praised. If I serve responsibly, they will give him or her the praise. Nobody take the praise. All glory go to God. We must be willing to pay the highest price in his service. Are you willing to pay the highest price in the service of the Lord? Are you willing? That's a question. I'd rather have Jesus than anything else. We just sang that song. Are you willing to pay the highest price? Are you willing to lay down your life, lay down your family for Jesus? You know, when we are scared, we begin to use all kind of excuses to save our so-called skin or save our so-called inadequacy. Jesus Christ our Lord gave his life for the purpose of saving the lost world. And we must ensure that this purpose endure to the end. We must be instrumental to bring about the preaching of the gospel to every soul. Faithfulness and full commitment help believers to achieve more for the Lord. When you are faithful and committed, you achieve a lot of things for the glory of God. Sometimes, church, listen. You might think it's easy to prepare a message. Sometimes it takes you hours. Last night, I slept this morning by 5 a.m. Can you believe that? 5 a.m. And I must be in office by 8.45. And I was in office by 8.45. There is no reward without sacrifice. No crown without cross. Do you enjoy serving the Lord? That's a question. Do you enjoy serving the Lord? Or you want to serve the Lord at your convenience? I want to serve you, Lord, through my own conditions. You must abide with my conditions. That's the kind of life we live. The more faithful and committed we are in the fulfillment of the heavenly vision, the more faithful we are able to bear things be able to bear things. Are you willing? You know, some of us serving the Lord is like, oh yeah, it's just secondary thing. You can sit down in your PC going through your own secular work for eight hours. When it comes to God thing, you just give God only five minutes. Because it doesn't make any sense to you. To the unfaithful, hear what the Lord Jesus said. Jesus has issued another warning afresh. Be zealous therefore and repent or he will take away the candle from you. Revelation 3.19 Will you be zealous from now? And say yes Lord. Even as the Bible says the zeal of God has consumed me. Have you been consumed by the zeal of God? That's a question. Have you been consumed by the zeal of God. Oh, you're still playing around.
Let's go to the third division. The nature of a true Christian commitment. Come with me a moment in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 1 through 5. The nature of true Christian commitment. So that you can ask yourself if you have it. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Let's stop the moment. He Apostle Paul writes to Timothy charging him before God and, Lord Jesus, and our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, preach the word in the season and also out of season. Are you preaching the word of God in season and out of season? But one thing is to preach, another thing is to practice. It takes one dimension to preach, take higher dimension to practice it. Are you a doer of the word or you are just a preacher? Anyone can preach, nice preaching. You know, today we have a lot of actors and actresses in the pulpit acting. But do we practice? Preach the word in the season, out of season. When somebody comes to you, you know pretty well that person is not a Christian. Do you open your mouth and share the gospel to that person? Do you know there are many people who are helpless, but they dare not open their mouth? You'll be shocked when you begin to share, you see tears coming down their eyes. Because of conviction. Some of us will say, I preach only when I find it. I say, preach in season, out of season. Every moment. What did he say? say? Convince. Convince the person. Rebuke his heart with all long suffering and teaching. Verse 3. For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desire, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Let's stop there. You see what's going to happen in these end times? Or even it's happening now. Many people don't want to hear the truth. The truth is giving them stomach problem. Because they have itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear, not what God wants to say. That's why we go to churches today. You know what we are seeing in the pulpit? We see people who only teach you how to. How to, but not why. That's all. May God have mercy on us. Everybody wants to be like Robinson. That's all. To teach how to. Mind power. Mind power. The gurus. That's all they want to know. How to make more money. Drive Mercedes, Rolls Royce. That's all. Nobody talk about righteousness. Church today has become business place where we exchange our name card, business cards. I am chairman of Singapore Limited. Oh, I am the director of Singapore Inc. Oh, I am the head of Pluto Public Listed Company. Pluto. That's all. We exchange cards so that we can do business. That's what we do. They come to church, no Bible. They sit down there. While the preaching is going on, they are telling the pastor, come. Come, because they are sleeping. Last night, they've been watching TV. So when they come, when the, Lord, when the preacher say, devil, are you here? They say, amen. <laughs> because that's, they, they didn't hear what you're saying. Eh? Come. That's all. They start calling. Then the pastor, if the pastor is wise, the pastor says no. <laughs> That's the kind of everybody wants to live according to their own whims and fancies and fantasies. Nobody wants to look. Certain preaching they will not hear. They don't want to hear about holiness. No. They tell you this is old time preaching. You know, this, this is not relevant. Today they talk about relevant messages. Yeah, relevant. 
you know, we, in our church we preach relevant messages. But not what God wants them to preach. It's relevant to tell how to make money. Because during Jesus' time, we don't need to make money. Holiness is not to be preached. Because it's old-time religion. And it continues. They heap up teachers for themselves. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. And be turned aside to fables. They like to hear fables. They will not like to hear the truth. Because the truth makes them feel uncomfortable. Have you seen some of your friends? When they tell you, uh, I don't feel comfortable in your church. You say, why? Because yeah, the message is too hard. It is not grace. No grace is a bit uh, uh, harsh. Because they are getting convicted. They don't want conviction. Everybody wants sugary, sugary message that make them to suffer from spiritual diabetes. That's what they want. Sugary messages. Verse 5. But you be watchful in all things. In your afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You hear what it says? Be watchful. We are supposed to be watchful. Are you watchful? So that nobody deceives you. Are you watchful? Be watchful. Be watchful. Be diligent. Endure sufferings. Yes, they will come against you. Today, if you want to have voice as a Christian leader in the body of Christ, that can only be determined by the size of your church. If your church is not 2,000, 3,000, when you speak, nobody will listen. Because no use. But if you are 10,000 above, even if you say, Jesus is not Lord, some will tell you it's correct. Because the size of your church is what determines your voice in the Christian community. No more righteousness. No more righteousness. We will always use every flimsy excuse to cover up sin. Because we don't want to hurt the people. If you speak the truth, the people will leave the church. How can I become a pastor of a church of 500 people when my church is 2,000? Therefore, I rather sacrifice truth to keep the congregation. That's what we see today. And many are going because that's what they want to hear. We must be willing to reach out and ask us a question. What am I embracing? Am I embracing truth or lies? Jesus is our perfect example. He gave his best, even his life, and he drank the bitter cup. Are you willing to give the best to the Lord? A true Christian commitment gives the best to the Lord. Are you willing to give the best? Check from our time. We don't give the Lord the best time. Many people want to read the Bible only when they are feeling sleepy. Anytime they're about to sleep, they say, okay, I go and read. They open the Bible. When they open, <laughs> some while reading the Bible, they start baptizing the Bible. The Bible said, those who believe shall be baptized, not you baptizing the Bible. <laughs> when they wake up, the whole Bible surface is soaked up with hopeless chow chow smell. <laughs> ah. Then they close it. I tell you what the Bible is suffering, only God knows. <laughs> That's the kind of life we live. Some people, when they cannot pray, the easiest way to sleep is to go to pray. The mama they says, so let us pray. Oh, how I love you. <laughs> and you're looking at them. Some even, their eyes are open while they're sleeping. And when you look at them, they do. <laughs> then you know that person is sleepy. That's the kind of life we live. I know of a couple who were praying. Whenever they want to pray, the husband will start sleeping. So the wife said, if we want to pray, we must kneel down. The husband said, better. Then he'll go and sit. While they're praying, kneel down. He's close to the chair. He will kneel 
kneel and lean towards the, ch the chair. <laughs> so they pray. This woman was very fervent, praying. So then observed that there no sound from the husband. <laughs> the first time she was scared, maybe he's gone. They let her find out he's sleeping. Next time they were about to pray, the same thing happened. So the woman said, You are stupid. Touch the husband, the husband said, Amen. <laughs> you see? You see? Because he was sleeping. <laughs> All he knows was Amen. Whatever you say, say Amen. <laughs> That's what he knows. Is that the kind of life you live? That's a question you ask yourself. Jesus paid the highest price. All this fulfill his father's will. Are you willing to pay the highest price in order to fulfill the will of God? He placed himself under an obligation and went to the last mile of the way. Will you go to the last mile of the way in order to fulfill the calling of God upon your life? Do you really serve with interest? Do you really serve God with all your skill, your strength? Your heart, or are you pretending? This must be the nature of our service, just as Jesus did, in order for us to fulfill the heavenly vision that we have received. We must be instant in the season and out of season, serving Him every moment. When it is convenient and when it is not convenient, when we must preach unto they preach the gospel of God to people who are literally hungry for the word of God. What are we to preach? We must preach the glorious gospel of the glorious kingdom of the glorified Lord. Will we do that? That's what God expects us. Don't preach your own gospel. Preach the glorious gospel of the glorious kingdom of the glorified Lord to the people that they will receive and thank God for sending Jesus unto us. We have a cloud of weaknesses of men and women who were faithful in their own duties as assigned to them by God during their own generation. In our generation, will you be faithful? That's a question. When we read about the cloud of witnesses, about those who had gone before us, everyone said, wow, they were so nice. They are like men and women, just as you are. Won't we be faithful? Look at such faithful men like Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 verse 9. He was faithful. Moses was faithful. Number chapter 12 verse 7. David the king was faithful. 1 Samuel 22 verse 14. Hanani and Hananiah. They were faithful people. Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 2. Uriah and Zechariah were faithful people, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 2. Daniel, the prophet, was a faithful man, Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Timothy was faithful, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Tychicus was faithful, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, and Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Epaphras was faithful, Colossians chapter 1, verse 7. Onesimus was faithful, Colossians chapter 4, verse 9. And Paul the Apostle was faithful. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. There are many other people who were faithful, which we cannot call them now. But these are exemplary people who were faithful to the very vision they received from God. Are you faithful? You know why many people do not want to lead? You know why? Because they know they are not faithful. When you call them, can you come and hit this department? Can you lead this? They give you a thousand and one excuses. You know what? They know they will not be faithful. It's not a, that they cannot do it. It's because they know they won't be faithful. All these are challenges to us. These men and women are challenges to us upon whom the end of the world are come. We have no excuse whatsoever not to be diligent. Unto God. No excuse. We must remain loyal and dedicated in the service of God. Are you loyal? Are you dedicated? Ask yourself a question. If the Lord were to come now and ask you to give account of what He has bestowed upon you as responsibility, do you have any account to present? This is a question. 
Check your life. But we can give account of gossiping. Talking about people. Using direct or indirect way to work people. We can give that account. We forget to know that what we sow, we will reap. Whatever you sow, you will reap. As God continues to speak to us through the word a week, what for a week? Concerning time management. Are you faithful even to your time? Yeah? That's a question. Your time, are you faithful? We talk about relationship. There is no relationship without commitment. And there is no commitment without time investment. You must know that. Do you invest your time wisely? Do you invest your time wisely? Are you diligent, faithful, sincere, honest towards the responsibility that God has bestowed upon your life? Do you know you are very important to God? You know why God put you where you are? Because he wants you to do something for him. Will you disappoint him? When people disappoint you, don't you feel bad? Don't you feel, how can it be? Then can you imagine how we grieve the spirit of God? Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Grieve not the spirit of the Lord. Do you know when you act irresponsibly, you are actually grieving the heart of God? You are putting him to shame. Because he looked at you. He has supplied you with all resources. He wants you to be an overcomer. If the Bible will talk about overcoming, which means there is something to overcome, the enemy will come. He will attack you. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus declared, in the world you have persecution. You have trouble. But be ye cheerful. I have overcome the world. He has overcome for us. The service you give unto God. Is it a faithful service? Committed service? Or you are just serving for serving sake? To show off. To display your talent. Sometimes people say, I spend much time more than anybody else. Do you know to whom more is given, more is expected of you? It's just like in area of giving. Maybe your salary is $20,000 a month. So because you are giving, tithe of 2000 does not mean that you're a good giver. It doesn't. Because God gave you a lot. God has given you much. Much is expected of you. You have time. Maybe you're a housewife. You don't have a lot, of work, a lot of time for you to do a lot of work for God. That does not mean that if you're a working class lady or a working class man, you don't have time to serve the Lord. How much time do you serve the Lord in the church? Within the week. God doesn't expect you to give him all your days. But the very time you're supposed to invest do you do that? That's a question. Do you serve God? You don't. Rather, wherever you go, you create some problem. Any department you go, their hands will be against you and your hand will be against them. You become Ishmaelite. Any church you go, you find fault there. How come they are clapping their hands? How come they didn't clap hands? How come they lift up their hands? How come they sit down? You must find something to say. Are you serving the Lord? The harvest is plenteous, yet the laborers are few. Jesus declared in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 37, the laborers are few, but the harvest is plenteous. Won't you say, Lord, here am I, send me? Eternal rewards await all the faithful disciples, just like you and I, if you're faithful. This again should stir up your heart. To do more for the Lord. Can God count on you tonight? Will you take a step forward and say, Lord, from now I commit myself for you to count on me. Also, eternal punishment awaits the lazy, lukewarm, and slothful servants. 
Are you lazy? Slothful? Lukewarm? The Bible said in the book of Matthew 25, verse 24 through 30, eternal punishment awaits them. The Lord is coming soon. Now is the time to wake up to our responsibility of winning the unbelievers, the sinners for Christ our King. Are you willing? Now is the time. Now is time for you to reschedule yourself concerning the service you give to the Lord. Now is the time for you to say, yes, Lord, I want to serve you in a better way. I want to commit my heart, my soul, love you all my strength, my heart, my soul, and serve you. There is much we can do for the Lord, our Savior, before he arrives in glory. Are you ready? Start that effective service now, not tomorrow. Start that service now. You know the quality of service you'll be giving to the Lord. You know that is not your best. What is withholding you? That's a question. What is withholding you from giving the Lord the best service? Many people don't want to belong to any church. You know why? Because they don't want to serve. They don't want to get involved. They just want to be tourists. Cruismatics, cruising from one shore of a church to another shore. They don't want to. I don't want to get involved. I just want to be myself. I just go to church. I worship the Lord. Think about your life. Can you imagine somebody who doesn't have a family? Your father, you don't know. Your mother, you don't know. You just know that you are existing. You were born. You need a family. Make up your mind. You need to serve God effectively, faithfully, and committedly. You can start it tonight, not tomorrow. When you hear the voice of God, don't harden your heart. Tonight is another chance for you to say, yes, Lord. I am willing to serve you more effectively than ever before.